I want to share with you this morning something that the Lord gave me um, this week. He pointed me to, you know, as he does so graciously, and he's opening up the word for us to understand it better. And I'm so glad to see my parents here this morning. He's opening up the word for us to see it more clear and to have more understanding. Sometimes the scripture that you would have seen so many times will take on this deep meaning to you when he opens the scripture up to you. And this week, I was just listening to my Bible one day, and he was, my mind just became enlightened on this story. And it's when Israel is, the Israelites are in the desert, and they get, um, they start complaining, right? They start complaining because they said that it's been so long since they had meat, now, the Lord's been providing them water. This is, I don't know how many, exact, exactly how many people we're talking about. Three, I don't know, a lot, <laughs> a whole nation. So, um, they're, they're traveling through the desert, and somehow they're getting water out of a rock. They're getting manna in the morning. But this doesn't seem sufficient to them. And they begin to complain. I want you to notice what they did. This was interesting to me and something I had never caught before. Now, they're all complaining. And they're not just complaining. They're saying it was better when the devil was our leader, when, when Pharaoh was over us. It was better. We had onions. We had garlic. We had leeks. We had meat. It was better back then. All of you that, you know, party, have partied in the world and got drunk and got smoked pot, did whatever you did, be careful what you say about those parties. Never say that was the funnest. Oh, that, that was the, the best memory. Don't say that because the God, your God, is jealous. He wants you to be in his presence so he can give you more than what you ever had back in those days. Um. So what do the Israelites do now? The Lord hears this, and he's furious. What, does, what do they do? Now, they must have got together and said, let's do this. It's like they, they start a drama. Every family goes into their own tent, and they start crying really loud. And every man stands at the door of his tent and cries. Ah, ah. Our God doesn't provide us good things. We had it better over there. Now think about that. The whole nation, how'd they get that news out? They have a newspaper. Word of mouth. Hey, get in your tent tonight. We're going to all start crying at the same time. And all the men stand at your doorway and start crying out loud in protest that our God doesn't supply our needs. Now this infuriated the Lord so much that he set a fire out among the camp um, and it burned on the outside of the camp and it burned through the camp and they really didn't fear him they just did what they did and not only did this dr drama not only did this drama they, they should have had reality TV back then that was a drama to be seen staged for the almighty I bet that was quite a sight to his eyes. And Moses was pretty ticked off about it himself. He was mad. He said, look at these people. Did I, did I carry these people? Did I, did I birth these people? Who, who birthed these people? These people were, you know, he was fed up. And the Lord was fed up. And he was, as, as he listened to them, he decided, okay, you want meat? I'll provide you with meat. So what he did was a huge pack of quail flew. And he told them, you could tell the, what, the message that he gave him them, he was not proud of them at all. He said, I'm going to give you meat until your nose stinks with it. He was pretty, he, he let them know, I am not pleased. Which they didn't seem to care and let that be a lesson to us all there's grace and then there's 
a nonchalant attitude in the presence of the Most High. So they went about their duty, and he told them this. He said, I'm going to give you quail tomorrow, but do not pick up more than what your family can eat for just that day. Now, what they didn't know, but what he knew was this was going to be a test because he was furious that they had told that they had told others about him that he was not a good provider. He sends quail. He sends it so deep. It was like two or three feet high on the ground. It was a as far as a day's journey outside the camp on one side and a day's journey one side of the other camp. That's how much quail there was. And he had told them, only take enough for one day. They get, they start loading. They don't listen to one word he says. They're not thankful for what he has provided. They don't fear him in his wrath. They accuse him of not being a a good provider and they don't even see they're walking into a trap laid by the almighty they start filling the buckets they fill on they fill on the fill until the the very least of all the people the people the one man that got the very least of everyone else still had three buckets full of quail that's when that's what did it and it came to my mind why that's what did it When he provided more than enough, he provided more than enough, but he also told them, only take what you need for one day. Now, after all these things he's done for them, he's provided them water, he's provided them food, he's provided them shoes that don't wear out, he's provided provided clothes that don't wear out. After each one of these things, now they come to him and they treat him like he's a liar He's not going to give a, we're not going to just take enough for today. We need some for tomorrow and the rest of this week. And they pile it up. And thus the wrath of the Lord now will be, will, they will suffer the wrath of the Lord now. What made him so furious? He says it. He says, you accused me of not being a good provider. Now, I want you to think about that. We want a lot of things. But the Lord tells us to take what we need, and that's what he's provided. And sometimes we think we fall short. Maybe you need a spiritual miracle in your life, and you need it to happen. But are you paying attention to each step that he's bringing you to or bringing someone to along the way? the thanksgiving of the progress. I remember my husband and I were praying for someone not long ago, and we were just talking about it, like, we just want to see some forward motion. And all of a sudden, the word of the Lord came to my husband while we were talking, and he said, first the physical, then the spiritual. He said, that's a scripture in the Bible, but I don't even know that scripture. Like, that just came to me right now. I said, are you sure it's a scripture? He said, yes, it's a scripture, but I don't, I've never even paid attention to that scripture. And then I started thinking about this. Each thing that we get that brings us closer to what we need, we take that as a provision, and it carries us to the next moment that we're in desperate need. The Lord, when he provides, he doesn't provide what you think is enough. He provides what he says is enough. Right? Sometimes they went without food a day. He didn't worry about it. You'll have something. You won't die. You'll survive. That's our problem. We think if we don't have every little thing that we are suffering And he says, collect enough for today, pray enough for today, and tomorrow you're going to need new provision. And I just thought, what an interesting thing. May we never, in our complaining, which is one of the things he hates, may we never not consider what he considers our provision. Because he is a good 
provider. I believe he is a great provider. Remember when you were a kid and you were in the grocery store and you were in front of the candy aisle and you felt like if you didn't get a candy, you was going to die? Well, you didn't get it and he didn't die either. Sometimes the Lord doesn't give us everything we want when we want it, but he gives us what we need. And my wife did mention that verse in Corinthians where Paul said, first that which is natural, then that which is spiritual. And when one star is differing from another star in glory and so on and so forth. So uh, sometimes when you see physical things happening to the people you're praying for, why don't you just assume that that's an indicator that something spiritual is taking place as well. Why don't we stand together and uh, we're going to dismiss our Sunday school. We welcome our guests this morning. If you are new to Pentecost, we pray that you'll have a great initiation. <laughs> and uh, that the Spirit of the Lord will become so close to you that you'll have to be back for more of God. I want to read from Romans chapter number four. Book of Romans is the theologian's book, if you ask me. You can get into some, some he deep weeds uh, there, but we won't do that. And if it feels deep to you, we'll come out of it. I want to read from uh, chapter four, verse 17 and 18. I'm reading from the New King James Version. As it is written... He's speaking concerning Abraham. I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed. God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Turn to your neighbor and say, you thought I was talking to myself. I wasn't. I was talking to things that have no existence. Who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. I want to preach from the subject Speaking to things that do not exist. Let's ask God's blessing upon his word. We love you, precious God in heaven, and we thank you right now for the word of the Lord that is real and powerful in this place. Minister to every life. And everybody said amen. amen. Turn to someone else. Say no existence. No problem. You may be seated. <laughs> God began his conversation with Abraham. He was Abram at the time. Upon his summons out of the Ur of the Chaldees, out of the region from which the Tower of Babel, somewhere in that zone, had emerged in protest against the authority of the Almighty God. He came out from a pagan world, out from a world that worshiped gods that were not gods. And upon his coming out of the land of Ur of the Chaldees, the Lord spoke to Abraham and said this. The Lord appeared, this is Genesis chapter number 12 and verse number 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared unto him. So God makes Abram an offer that he simply cannot refuse. Not only does he offer him a land that would become his own, but he says that that land will be populated with children 
with his own offspring. And of course, Abraham was somewhere in his 70s now, and he and his wife were not able to have children. Um, please, whenever you try to find an excuse for not doing what God wants you to do or being who God wants you to be, don't make the mistake of saying, I'm not able. Moses tried it. It didn't work. You know, Abram, perhaps, yeah, he did try it. Lord, I'm old. Sarah, she laughed. I'm old. Didn't work. Can I tell you something? God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think according to the power that works inside of him. So, so Abraham here, uh, Abram rather, uh, said, uh, okay, Lord, it's a deal. And, and Abram, but Abram's believing God, I want you to know this in the story of Abram, the fact that he accepted God's offer and that he believed God did not yield instantaneous results. I'm preaching to folks that believe God. You are believing God, but you are growing weary because it has been such a long season of not reaping results. I want, does anyone want some help with that this morning? Hopefully you're going to get some. Well, it all revolves around how to speak to things that have no existence. Let me show you how. The Lord did it. In Genesis 15 and verses 1 through 6, it reads like this. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. It said, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And remember, chapter 12, he was promised children. Chapter 15, he reminds God of what hasn't happened yet. And one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky, count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Watch verse number six. And Abram believed the Lord. King James said he believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Okay, now here is a believer. Everybody say, Abram's a believer. God accepted his belief, but notice Years continue to go by. So he's somewhere in his 70s. And approximately 24 years later, after Abram has tolerated a substitute and produced an Ishmael, who is the son of a bondwoman, who has presented problems for the Hebrew people ever since, to this very day, but it wasn't until the 17th chapter, I want you to notice. Abram now is 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. And Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer. Everybody say no longer. No longer, no longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations and will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. No longer will you be called Abram. Now your name is Abraham, which means father of many nations. Hear me. 24 years he had believed and accepted the promise with no children. The minute God changes his name, 
and causes Abraham to call himself a father. One year later, amen, the promised child is born. My God, I'm telling you, I'm giving you a name change notification this morning. You cannot see a divine breakthrough if you don't change the language with which you address the unreceived stuff. Somebody needs to call it by name. You need to call the blessings in. You need to call the healing forth. All right, I know. You're, I'll help you some more here. Sarah also needed a name change notification. Sarah was called Sarai up until this point. And then God makes a subtle change. And your wife, Sarai, shall be called Sarah. So if you look up the difference between Sarai and Sarah, it can be almost indistinguishable if you just pass over it. But Poole said it this way, Sarah signifies a lady or a princess, and Sarai signifies a lady as well and a princess. But Sarai signifies the princess of one family, and Sarah signifies the princess of a multitude or of a nation. So the father of nations is married to the princess of multitudes equals a child and a descend a line of descendants that will fill the land. Oh my God. What am I trying to say? God cannot bless us as long as all we care about is me, mine, and ours. It is when we develop an attitude of kingdom-mindedness. It's when we plug in to something that is so much bigger than we are. Oh, brothers and sisters, it's time to quit praying just for God to fill our church with revival. But let revival sweep across the land and around the world before the Lord comes. Does anybody have a multitude on your mind? Does anybody see the possibility that God, amen, can do things greater than we could ever imagine? So this is how, in case you haven't caught on yet, how does God call the things that are not as though they are? He changes names. He began by changing Abram to Abraham, thus forcing Abraham to call himself Daddy. Then he expected, not only did God call him this, but he expected Abraham to answer to the name that God had given him. And in less than one year's time, after God changed the way he addressed himself, the miracle pregnancy came and the baby came. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is here, God's printed word is part of the solution. God, but God's written promises are designed to be repeated by faith-filled people of God. In order for God's spirit to give life to the dead, he had to call into existence the things that were not as though they were. The Bible speaks of a lot of things that are not as though they were. Something like this. By his stripes ye were healed. But it's not enough to just lay there in Isaiah 61. It's got to rise up in the heart of God's people. And we need to say, amen, diabetes, by his stripes you are healed. Come on, somebody. Amen. 
So I want you to understand the impact of this. The spirit realm is programmed to agree with the words that come out of your mouth. Heaven is programmed to do it, and hell is programmed to do it. Heaven is ready to join forces with your prayers. And hell is ready to join forces with your negative soothsaying. That's why I want to speak for God. I want to speak to what doesn't exist, for a God who does exist, in the name of Jesus, which is the name above every name, for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Watch this. Adam's first task uh, when he was created was to name the animals. The Bible said that God marched the animals in front of Adam and However he named those animals, that's what God called them to. How about that? You talk about maybe how hard it is to agree with God. God agrees with you too sometimes. He agreed with uh, Adam, and whatever Adam called the animals, that's what God called them. Why did Adam have to name the animals? Was God drawing a blank? Of course not. God was teaching Adam, something about the way he was designed. You see, the God that we serve is a speaking God. And Adam didn't have anybody to talk to yet. So he wanted to get Adam used to using the language capability that God had given him. A speaking God wants a speaking people. It's time to unzip your lip. If angels can stand in his presence 24-7 for eons of time and never lose a desire to give him praise, who do we think we are that we can fold our arms and remain quiet in the house of God? We ought to shout every time we get a chance. We ought to say hallelujah. We ought to wake up in the morning and say thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, but you said if you you said, but if you lived in the world I lived in, you wouldn't have anything to say. Let me tell you something. God experienced the world you lived in, and the world was void and without form and darkness upon the face of the deep. And God said, Let there be light. Oh, hallelujah. The darker your world is, the more you need to speak to it. The more depraved your neighborhood is, the more you need to speak to it. The more disinclined to please God in your body and flesh, the more you need to speak to it. Not less, more. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. God was not only teaching Adam that he was a speaking being, but he was teaching Adam that names are not predicated on appearances alone, But by naming the creatures, you are also understanding their nature. If you want to learn a little something about the spirit world, watch some animal shows. Don't listen to what the man is saying necessarily. Just watch the nature that is revealed in the animals themselves. So with Adam... He wasn't just looking at stripes. If that was the case, he'd call a tiger a striper. Or a frog a croaker. No, but he was noticing those that were solitary. Those that were social. Those that were powerful. Those that were melodious. Burrowers. Flyers. Swimmers. Climbers. Warm-blooded. Cold bubble, you learn a lot when someone wants you to name everything that passes by. But notice something, when Eve is presented to Adam and God takes her from his side and presents her to him, he doesn't call her Eve. He says, woman. 
Now, I know, I know, because it's a woe. It's a woe, old man. Yeah, she was all of that too, I'm sure. But this is why he called her woman. This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So she shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. That's Garden of Eden analysis, okay? And that was to deal with origins and essences, okay? I'm going somewhere. But by naming the animals, God was teaching Adam to speak to essences of living beings, all right? So we need to remember that there is something behind the face of everyone that you meet. Okay? If we're not careful we can commit the fallacy of context. Everybody you meet, every face you see, must be placed in a proper context. This is why there are courts of law. This is why there are discovery of facts. This is why uh, there are tests that are run medically to help place the person where they are in relationship to what's wrong with them. So the uh, fallacy of context is kind of like what Aristotle called the fallacy of accent. What Aristotle meant when he talked about the fallacy of, of, of accent is this. You can change the meaning of a statement by the way you say the words. Let me do it with the Bible, just for illustration purposes. Ephesians 4, 28 reads like this. Let him that stole steal. No more let him labor the thing that is, the, rather labor working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let him that stole steal. No more. But rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good. And some of you former pickpocket five finger discounters don't shout yet. That's, that might be what Robin Hood would say. But that's not the way a child of God reads. But that's a fallacy of accent. You add a comment and you change the emphasis on the words and you can get an entire different meaning out of it. Well, it's the same way with you and I. Did you know your life is a story? Did you know your life is a narrative? Who are you anyway? I'll tell you who you are. You're the tape that plays over and over. That's who you are, essentially. You're the story that plays between your ears. I'm certainly not what I, who I am when I was 18. I'm all remanufactured since then. They say that the cells in the body replace themselves every seven years or so. So you're not the same person you were seven years ago, so your wife was right. <laughs> who are you then? You are what you remember. You are the story you tell yourself. You are that, that, that narrative. Huh. And did you know that God is the author and the finisher of our faith? You know, part of our problem is, is we want to finish the story. Don't mess with the narrative. God's not through with you yet. If you jump in there and change the outcome in your own head, you're going to run right smack dab into a problem with God. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't, I'm not everything I want to be or hope to be, but I know this. I know the one who holds my future, and he holds your future too, and he's not finished writing the story of your life. But why are things going so bad? Because every good story has some switchbacks. He's not writing a Dr. Seuss rhyme. He's writing a novel, an epic something you're going to embrace throughout all of eternity and share with us. That's why it's so interesting. Just hold on. God's got a plan. I know the plans that I have for you. They are plans to bless you and to give you a future. Hallelujah. All right, watch this. Adam named the animals to demonstrate his relationship to the rest of creation. A name is more than a simple identification for a child or a pet. Hear me. 
when we name something, it is a spiritual act. How do I know that? Naming creates a soul bond between you and the person or thing that you have named. The devil should have taught you that when you were a sinner. The devil uses labels. God uses names. Satan wants you to wear a label that somebody else put on you. Idiot. Useless. Faithless. No good. Come on, somebody. Those who raise animals for food often will tell their children not to name the lamb. For reasons that are obvious, it's hard to whack the head off a chicken that you named Betsy. Children are famous for bringing their stuffed animals to life by giving them names. If you've ever driven an old car that gave you cause to praise God just because it started up, You named it, I promise you. And you tap the steering wheel and say, thank God, old old Joe came through again today. Some decades ago was a book written called A Child Called It. Anyone ever read it or seen it? I don't recommend it. It's dreadful. It's ghastly. It's a story of like so many like it when a child is so betrayed by Uh, a parent's authority that they treat them worse than an animal. Locked in closets, burnt with hot irons, starved, beaten mercilessly, and called it. Well, you know, you almost have to do that to treat a human being like that. You have to depersonalize them. Okay, now here comes something fun. Nebraska Middle School distributed a gender-inclusive guideline encouraging teachers to avoid calling their students boys and girls. I know what I'm doing. The handout suggested students at Irving Middle School in Lincoln could be referred to as campers, athletes, or even purple penguins. The reason behind the handout was that the public schools wanted to be careful not to hurt anyone who might be going through a gender identity crisis. There are people that go through gender identity crises. And if someone here is going through a gender identity crisis, this might surprise you, but we're not your enemy today. But the answer to helping someone who is confused about who they are is not to depersonalize the entire society around them so that nobody knows who they are or what to call each other. The way you help a sick person is not make the whole hospital staff sick, but they need to be healthy so they can nurture you back to health again. Satan is the arch depersonalizer. If Satan had his way, it would be call them campers, athletes, purple penguin, or legion. Jesus gave us the answer on how to treat people who are different than we are. Are you ready for this? You ready? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love and reach out to the lost sheep and leave the 99 if you have to and go after that. When was the last time you walked away from your fellowship circle, which you're so comfortable in at church, to reach out to somebody who you know is disenfranchised and hurting inside? Huh? That's what you do. Oh, come on, somebody. There's a, there is, it's time to be a friend of the friendless. It's time to touch the leper. The answer is love. 
The answer is fellowship and friendship. The answer is reaching out. The answer is acceptance. The answer is prayer. In the art of war, one of the first things that needs to happen is objectify the enemy. You must reduce the person you plan to kill to the level of an object. The Nazis were famous for this. Jews, gypsies, anybody they disagreed with in their society were given names or symbols to go by. You have numbers, rather, or symbols. And they were depersonalized. But in the church, we need to know each other's name. In the church, you need to be called my brother, my sister. Take me by the hand. Together, we're going to work until he comes. Oh, hallelujah. You're not a number. You're not a Sunday school number. You're not an Easter statistic. You are my brother, my friend, my neighbor. Come on, somebody. It's time we learn each other's names. You can't hardly gossip maliciously about somebody who you know by name. Say, my problem is not gossip. Your problem might be running your own self down too much. When are we going to stop identifying ourselves by what's wrong with us? Huh? I'm broke. I'm tired. I'm sick. I'm old. I'm a loser. Hmm. Sounds like we could write a song. I'm old, old, old because I'm tired, tired, tired. I'm sick and broke, broke, broke. I'm a loser. Is that the song you're going to sing the rest of your life? Or are you going to be able to call yourself something that you're not right now, but someone that God said you could be? Remember, the miracle doesn't happen till the change begins in you. Oh, hallelujah. So hear me. What? What? Okay, Jesus. You say, oh, oh, this is all really cool and really interesting, but what, what's, it, what's useful is it? Same useful it was for God to call himself by so many names. How about this? 1 Corinthians 15, 45, and so it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, but the last, who was the last Adam? Why did he call himself the last Adam? Because the first Adam messed everything up for us and we needed another one to fix it. So he's the last Adam. He's called the advocate, 1 John 2 and 1. Why is he called the advocate? Because if any man sin, if you've never sinned and you don't need an advocate, then don't call him advocate. But is there anybody under the sound of my voice that knows what it means to have an advocate? He's called the Almighty. Why? Because mighty isn't enough sometimes. We're up against such principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness and forces. He said, I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the first. I am the last. The Almighty. He's called the arm of the Lord in Isaiah 51 and 9. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, as in ancient days, in the generations of old, thou art not, uh, art thou not it that shall cut Rahab and wound the dragon. Yeah, the arm of the Lord bears the sword of the Lord to slay the dragons of hell. You know I could go on with this. Uh, he's the blessed and only potentate. He's the captain of our salvation. Why captain? So your ship don't go down. You need somebody who knows these waters and can carry you safely through to the other side. If God, oh, hallelujah, we could go on. The light of the world, Emmanuel, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Why? Why is God calling himself all these things? These are the things that we need him to be. Oh, my God. 
And so it took less than one year of Abraham calling himself a father till he became a father. Oh, God have mercy. What would happen if in the next year, for one year, everyone, amen, that calls themselves old will start saying, I'm still young. What if the weak said, I'm strong? What if the poor said, I'm rich? Somebody needs to change your name to rich. What if the confused said, I'm made in the image of God? I challenge you, call yourself by the name of the person you want to be and by the thing you need God to do. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, watch this, now let's stand. And so Adam doesn't name Eve, uh, Eve, he, he names her woman at first because that's Garden of Eden talk, that's innocence talking. He doesn't name her Eve until after the fall. That's when you need faith the most. What does Eve mean, Mother. She hadn't been a mother yet. But in the, after the fall, faith kicks in. Mother of all living. Genesis chapter number three and verse number 16. God said, you're going to be a mama. And what's going to be born of you is going to undo all of this shame and pain and curse that's been brought upon us by our failure. Eve, mother. Let me tell you something. I don't care how far you've fallen. I don't care where you've fallen from. I don't care who you are now to compare to who you used to be. If you'll just call yourself by the future that God promised you, you will see that in a short time, the very thing that has never happened happened yet. It isn't that you didn't believe. It isn't that you, Abraham believed for 24 years. It isn't that you didn't believe, but you failed to call the things that are not. Hmm. Lift your hands right now. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and magnify the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Call the things that are not. Oh, God. Call yourself faithful. Call yourself holy. Call yourself righteous. Call yourself loving. Call yourself compassionate. Hallelujah. My God. Is there anybody that needs God to do something? You've been believing, but it hasn't happened yet. But you need to activate this promise. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to call it. We're going to call it before it gets here. We're going to name ourselves by it. We're going to name someone else by it. We'll name whatever it is we need to name in the name of Jesus till it comes. Would you step out from where you are and come to this altar right now? Calling, call, call. Calling the things that are not. Call the things that are not as though they are. If you're a student and you're struggling with algebra, and the devil tries to tell you you're slow in your head, don't call yourself slow. Don't say, I don't do math. Say, I haven't done math yet, but I'm a mathematician. My God, in the name of Jesus. Ooh, if you have been diagnosed with some kind of chronic sickness that the doctors say you're just going to have to manage, hmm, what would it hurt to name the body part that's suffering, healthy. <laughs> huh? Quit calling it my heart trouble. Why don't you call it my healthy heart? <sighs> Jesus, 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 Jesus. Holy Ghost, I feel the Holy Ghost power in this place. Mm. Oh God. Oh, God, we love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody, do you know, we're going to get some reports. We better mark the calendar. Because I'm going on record. If you can do it, if you can keep it for 
uh, the, the next year, you're going to see by this time next year, the thing you said you are, you'll be. The thing you said you needed done will be done. The answer you've been waiting on all this time will be here. Oh, God, in the name of Jesus. Come on, call it, call it, call it, call it. That's what God does. Call it. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah.